Well, hello, I am Jeff Barr, and today I'm here with Anthony Ligori, and we're going to talk all about some really geeky hardware stuff and how it came to be. Uh, even though I'm mostly a software person, I love to get deep and dirty with hardware tech, and as, as I'm looking at all these neat things, I'm super excited about uh, talking to Anthony and learning a lot more about not just what these are, but how they came to be and the different design decisions that we made. So. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, and then uh, let's talk a bit about uh, what we're doing here with all these cool pieces of hardware. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Anthony Ligori, and I'm a vice president and distinguished engineer in EC2. And I've led the design and development of the Nitro system over the last uh, eight years or so. All right, so we're part of Silicon Innovation Day today. And so clearly, we've got lots and lots of amazing silicon here in front of us, uh, part of the, the Nitro system. So. What, what do we have here? Why did, why did we decide to build these Nitro cards and uh, what are they all about? Yeah, so we started Nitro about 10 years ago. And um, at that time, uh, if you think about like what computers were like, uh, most computers had one gig networking, the same sort of uh, networking speeds that you find in your home today. Um, you mostly had hard drives, which you know honestly haven't really uh, increased performance in the last 20 years because they're um, limited by the laws of physics, you can only spin a magnetic platter so fast before it explodes, yeah. right? Which would be a whole different video. Whole, whole different video, <laughs> a lot of fun, but a different different story. So, but around 10 years ago, the industry started going through this massive transformation. Uh, in EC2, we introduced our first instance types that had 10 gig networking. We started to see the rise of SSDs and solid state storage that could perform, you know, at much lower latencies and much higher throughput. And basically, virtualization technology wasn't keeping up. And so we started to explore um, how we could hardware offload a lot of um, these, uh, this I.O. performance so that we could actually deliver bare metal performance to customers. And that's really what started the journey. And we started with networking, and we just kept going incrementally, step by step, until we ultimately released what we call the full Nitro system, uh, which offloads everything and delivers um, you know, uh, indistinguishable from bare metal performance for customers and comes with a lot of other interesting advantages. Okay, so which way are we going? <clears throat> which, way, which way is Time so, Zero so going? But we can start all the way from this side, and this was the original Annapurna uh, Nitro card that we used. And so this is the card that we launched with the C4 instance type in 2015, mm. I believe. Okay. And so as you can see, it's labeled. That was 10 gig networking, and there were two different uh, networking ports. One was for um, VPC, and the other was for EBS. And so that, so that at that point in time, we could do r roughly 20 gigabits of networking. So this is the actual physical realization of when I'm writing a blog post about a new instance type, and it says we've got this much network bandwidth and this much EBS bandwidth, they are physically plugged into that, these two That is connectors. what it is, absolutely. Yes. Wow. Yes. I, after writing about that for a decade, I finally get to see where the, those bits Ex Exactly, flow through. yeah. OK, all right, so we start here, and we've got pure networking. <laughs> Right, and so that was the very first generation. And so the really interesting thing about the Nitro story is it's not just about these different card form facts, factors, but we've been building silicon generation to generation. And so that was the first generation of Annapurna silicon. The next card um, next to you is actually a brand new processor. And so that was a brand new SOC that we built, even though it's roughly the same form factor card. And the really exciting thing about that generation is that it introduced 25 gig networking. And so you can physically see that the connector on it is bigger, and that's because yeah, okay. um, we've got that larger size connector. Yeah, right there. you literally need to move more data, so you need a bigger <laughs> wire, <Okay>. effectively. <laughs> and so uh, that was really pivotal because, besides letting us do 25 gig networking, that really formed the basis for allowing us to build the full Nitro system. Mm -hmm. the, the next card that you see is the same silicon, but it's actually two SOCs in a single mm -hmm. card. What is an SOC? An SOC is a system on a chip. So in the uh, world of ARM and in a lot of embedded systems, we don't just talk about a processor. We end up putting networking devices and, and storage accelerators and things like that all in the same piece of silicon. This helps to drive cost down, power consumption down, and ultimately gives you better performance. And so we design a full SOC, a full So we do one integrated system. design. We take all the parts. We make them all work together on, on that, that single chip and fab that as just one unit. Absolutely. And each of these cards is effectively a full standalone computer. 
It's got its own dedicated RAM. It's got its own I.O. devices. It is a full standalone computer. In fact, if you just applied power on the right uh, pins on the bottom, it would boot up and it would be a full-blown independent system by itself. All right. Now, you, you mentioned ARM. Is this an ARM-based uh, set of systems? Yes. All of these systems are, are based on ARM. And that's really important because it allows us to um, leverage all of the innovation that's happened in the ARM ecosystem. And ultimately, you know, this whole line of chips is what gave us a lot of experience in doing ARM and enabled things like Graviton, um, where we actually produced server-based uh, ARM chips. It, interesting. So I, I used to joke that processors often went from the, they'd be a, a very powerful CPU, and then as they got somewhat more obsolete, they'd ultimately end up powering the keyboard. But it seems like we've actually gone the other way around from being <laughs> the network peripheral right. to being the CPU. And, and this is really the, um, yes, that's true. And there's actually some magic in how we build these cards. Um, so if you think about traditional virtualization, if you're running you know, VMware or KVM on a typical system, all of the I.O. performance is being emulated by a general pro purpose processor. We actually are able to use uh, significantly uh, lower end processors on these cards because of all of the hardware offload that we add in the system. And so when you send a packet um, over VPC with Nitro, that packet doesn't really touch the CPU. It doesn't touch the memory on these cards. It actually just flows through the hardware. And, and the software that we build on these cards is really just programming the, um, the IO engines in the card to do all of that work for you. OK, so, so literally directly from the network port into main memory? That's correct, yep. Or through, through the connector, of Absolutely, course, but out, yes. out to mid memory. Yeah. And, and so that gives you super fast performance. It also allows us to do things like inline encryption. And so one of the really cool things that um, we were able to do throughout these generations of cards is actually do uh, full uh, encryption at line rate for VPC. And so um, you know, we're launching platforms today that can do 800 gigabits of oh. networking. Um, and that's all encrypted. Every single bit of it is encrypted. Likewise. Um, we're able to do uh, all of our at re all, all of our at rest data is encrypted, um, and again, that all happens in hardware. In fact, we built a special card just for that, and so this is the card right here that we use to do um, instant storage in EC2, and so th this is based on the same SOC as the other cards. However, this one is able to do. Um, you know, uh, line rate encryption for NVMe devices. And so every NVMe device that you see in EC2 is ultimately behind one of these cards and is uh, encrypted through this card. So when, when you say line rate and the way we're doing I.O., the traditional I.O. at the lowest level was that you, the processor would get involved with literally every byte of, okay, there's a byte coming from the controller. Okay, put it in the buffer, fill up the buffer. Uh, buffers full, move along to the next thing. That's right. And you could also do encryption and decryption on those buffers. But it, it sounds like you're saying encryption and decryption is basically a, a streaming process. Is that absolutely about it? So if we go back to uh, before we started the Nitro journey, the typical hard drive can do about 200 megabytes per second of data transfer and generally around 200 IOPS. Not very many, <laughs> right? Again, it's because of physics. You're moving a, a platter head around. With a modern NVMe drive, it's pretty normal to do two gigabytes of data per drive. And when you look at something like our recent i4i um, instance type, um, you've got eight drives. And so that's all additive. And so you're literally driving 16 gigabytes of data through all of those drives. Um, a, a modern CPU is just not going to keep up. You're going to burn most of your CPU just trying to do encryption. Mm -hmm. um, the other really interesting thing about um, NVMe compared to hard drives is latency. Um, accessing a new block on a hard drive is milliseconds of latency. Um, accessing a new area of an NVMe drive is microseconds of latency. If you're trying to use software, you're just never going to meet those latency sure. targets. Now, you said something really interesting in passing there that we'd love to dive in a bit more. You, you said that so th this is handling the instant storage, and you said it's the same system on a chip there as we have on the other cards? It, it is, right. And so what we've done throughout the, the Nitro system is we've tried to reuse components as much as we can. And in fact, um, in many of our systems, there are actually many cards involved in the server design. And so this is a lot, one of the reasons why we've been able to launch so many different uh, variations of instance types. So today we, we have over 500 uh, instance types and it's growing almost every single day these yeah, days. That, that I definitely know. <laughs> We're keeping you busy writing blog, blog posts for sure. 
And a lot of that is because we've been able to drive all these innovations just by adding more cards or rearranging the configuration of cards within the server. Okay. Now, we often talk about all of these elements as building blocks. And I love to build things with Lego. And to me, part of the creative process is not always starting out to actually solve a problem, but to just have the pieces laying around and just kind of plugging them together in different ways and saying, hmm, that looks like a door desk, or that's a house, or this is a robot, whatever. Is there an equivalent creative process when we're building things with Nitro? This has been one of the really great things about Annapurna Labs is that when you're designing silicon, um, it's really hard to know what the use cases are going to be um, because you're usually designing for three or four years out. And so you have to anticipate all of the possible things that can come along or what the new requirements are. Uh, you know, if you think about a software world, if you're a software engineer, you're used to requirements changing every like month, mm -hmm. right? Like there's just constant churn on requirement changes. Uh, the thing that um, the Annapurna team really excels at is finding ways to make the silicon super flexible so that over time we can actually change what we're doing with it and we actually can do things that we didn't necessarily start out thinking that we were going to do um, and, and eventually get there. As an wow, example okay. of this, the instant storage card, when that SOC was originally built, that wasn't one of the use cases in mind, but we were able to build that card over time because the underlying hardware is so flexible. Okay, which back early, early in my career, I used to write IO drivers. And at that point, you get a card and you get a really badly written manual with a bunch of registers and bit by bit identification of read this or write that. It was almost always really fla fla flaky. It was inflexible. You'd have to really experiment a lot. And it was clear that it was, they were just giving you the hardware. They really, really had never thought through, like, let's make this usable or programmable or make it effectively the user friendly. It, it sounds like we've gotten a little bit past that mode of design. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, when, we first, when I first met the team at Annapurna, my first reaction was, this is hardware that was built by software designers. They, they understood that having all of the devices have common interfaces made it way easier for software developers because you weren't trying to figure out, how do I get this device to work and this other device is totally different? And so um, that's been a big part of allowing us to move really fast with this, this type of hardware. Interesting. Now, I, I know that one of the things that we, this enabled us to do was to do bare metal instances. How, right. how do we actually do that? So um, if, we, if we look at these cards and we kind of walk through the journey, mm -hmm. Um, the first couple cards, and so basically the things we launched in 2015 and 2016, um, they only accelerated I.O. And so we still had the Zen hypervisor. We still had a lot of our control software running on the Intel processors. Um, this was actually the very first card that shipped with C5. And this was the, full, uh, the first full Nitro system. And one of the reasons it has two of these SOCs is that we moved the entire um, software stack onto this card. And so with this particular card, if you power it on, um, it, it effectively acts as an EC2 server. It doesn't actually need to be connected to anything else. All of our control plane logic, all of the software that we need to operate an EC2 server is in that card. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the way that I think about the Nitro system is that these cards are the server and that the uh, Intel or AMD or even Graviton processors we, we connect, they're really just peripherals for the card. Like, this is the core of the oh, server. Okay. Um, and it's really kind of an inverted model. So the, the tail is wagging the dog. Exactly. The consequence of that is that we don't really care about the software that's running on the peripheral. And so in an EC2 uh, metal instance type, we're really just treating the processor as oh, a wow. peripheral. The processor has been demoted and it doesn't it, even it's know It's been it. demoted. Okay. It doesn't play that important of a role anymore in the system. And so that, that allows us to support true, like multi-tenant safe bare metal. So it, it just has its own little job, like everything else on the, the, the bus, right? Its yeah. job is just get stuff out of memory and decode it, execute it, put stuff back into exactly. memory. Exactly, yeah. Interesting. So, do, okay, so ultimately when we do an EC2 run instance call, that goes through a bunch of security and a bunch of network pieces and through our control plane and it gets to the card and the card says, okay, let's put some stuff into memory yeah. and let's run it? Absolutely, so the, the way this would work at a high level is that the, um, our control plane processes the request and it actually talks to these cards because our hypervisor that's typically running on either the Intel, AMD or Graviton processor doesn't actually even have a networking stack. 
it can't speak TCP, it doesn't have networking drivers, it doesn't have even file system drivers, it's very minimalistic. And so all of the processing necessary for launching an instance actually happens on these cards. One of the things that's really exciting about that is that these cards are physically separate from where the customer's code is running. And so um, the, the interface between them is just PCI. Uh, this actually gives the Nitro system a security posture that's unmatched because even if you have full access on the Intel, if you break out of the hypervisor as an example, you don't have access to these cards. Yeah, so you, the, the peripherals can't get to exactly. Nitro. Exactly, and the whole system is designed assuming that those that peripheral is insecure and not trusted. And we've taken this so far that we don't just support metal instances, but we've uh, gone as far as to put a Mac Mini in a server and just connect the Mac Mini to these cards and really just treat the entire Mac Mini as a peripheral where we can just offer that to customers and let them go wild well, with that, it. That's a great example of a building block. So the Mac Mini itself, is that's just the code execution engine. It's just the us. code execution engine, wow. yeah. Now, going to that latest generation of cards, why did we have to go to that massively more um, sturdy heat sink on there? So um, this is the latest generation of card that's available in um, the C6i and the C CG, or sorry, the C6G um, instance types. And um, one of the big things that we did in this generation of instance type is um, increase the available networking that's uh, on the platform. And that's because as you go genera generation to generation, uh, we see increasing core density, increasing performance requirements. And so uh, we took the opportunity not just to um, increase networking, but really consolidate a lot of the function of the various Nitro cards. And so, at some level, when you're working with building blocks, if you start <laughs> combining a lot of building blocks in a common way, it's better just to build one block instead of having two blocks. And so that's, that's where we are in our latest generation. Ah, okay. Wow. So when you are designing these, what, what is the, the level at which you design? Is, is it like big modules full of logic, or do you have to get to the gate level? or? Uh, what, 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 what particular part do you like to do? Yeah, so, so for me, I'm a software guy. And so uh, I work on the software side of these cards, but I work super closely with the team at Annapurna Labs. And so typically, um, you know, we're working hand in hand together throughout the early design phase, and then also through the bring up phase. Um, but my, myself and most of the other folks in EC2, you know, we build the software that runs on these cards. Okay. So ha having been in, semiconductor fabs. One, one of the coolest things I've ever visited was a semiconductor fab and just watching the, the many robots and the many different processes and all the different raw, literally raw elements that go into making, making that. It, it's very interesting to me how every generation of tech is necessary to construct the next generation of tech. How does that play into what we do with Nitro? Yeah. One of the amazing things is that uh, when we first acquired Annapurna Labs and they joined the AWS family, uh, they immediately started moving all of their EDA functionality into AWS. And they saw a significant benefit to it. And um, you know, we've continued over the years to actually build instance types that are optimized for these types of workloads. As a good example, the Z1 instance type, which we launched a couple years ago, uh, has really high frequency processors, which is ideal for doing this type of EDA work. Yeah. Um, it's been a great, like, mm -hmm. virtuous cycle because, one, um, we benefit a lot from making mm -hmm. use of EC2 and all of the flexibility of the cloud in designing these chips. But also, um, as we learn about this, we're able to make it available for other customers, and they see the same thing, that it turns out the cloud is great for doing EDA-type workloads. Very interesting how there's, there's this, we, we talk about the virtuous cycle, and this, this really sounds like one of them, where the, the better we can make each generation of EC2 run, the more quickly it can effectively obsolete itself by absolutely. designing the next generation. Totally, absolutely. What, what kind of life cycle do we have as far as like from, we say we're gonna build a new one to we go through the, this is what it should be, to let's build it, simulate it, get it uh, fabbed. Is that yeah. years, quarters, how, how does that work out? Uh, the whole process uh, is usually anywhere from two to three years, um, and so uh, that's for doing an actual SOC design. For doing board spins, we can actually go very fast. And a lot of the variations that we've done, we've been able to do in months versus years. Um, but even a two-year cycle in the silicon industry is almost unheard of. Um, it, you know, typically, uh, silicon cycles are you know, three, even five years of time. 
And so uh, you know, we, we put a lot of effort into making sure that we can deliver very quickly, iterate fast, and then you know, learn. Mm. Does this mean that we have, have effectively like a, a pipeline architecture where we, we've got several different things in various stages of conceptualization and design and implementation? Oh, absolutely. So um, you know, we're obviously well underway of building next generation Nitro cards. And we've got you know, more, uh, more than one in the hopper, we'll say. Right. Um, it's always good to, uh, um, to attend reInvent because you know, we always announce interesting things and you can imagine we're probably going to announce other interesting things at yeah, reInvent this year. It, the, the pace of how we're able to do this is just staggering. Absolutely. That, uh, you know, back in the days when I would build my own PCs and you'd, you'd eagerly await the next generation of processors, but it was the processor would launch, so you have to wait for the motherboards to show up, you have to wait for the software to support it, then you have yeah. to wait for all the, the bugs to shake out. And so the launch date of something new, that just said we're, we're, it's closer for it to be available to you. It doesn't usually mean you can get it, yeah. but the fact that it's all cloud-based means we launch it and there it is for customers, which I, I find really cool. That's totally right. Um, I've worked my entire career in hardware and, and the software boundary, and you know, previously I've worked on things like mainframes. And the thing about building mainframes is that you know, they're designed for years, they're tested for years, and so as an engineer, it's incredibly unsatisfying to work on something and it, for customers not to see it for five, seven, eight years, yeah. right? Like you start thinking about your career as like, okay, I get like three launches. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's been amazing about um, being a part of AWS and you know, going through the journey with Nitro is that we've been able to iterate so many times and so incrementally and um, just deliver so much new innovation to customers you know, with hardware and software, which you know, if you would have asked me 10 or 15 years ago, I would have said, no, no one can move that fast. I was sure by this point in my career that things would be really boring and that things would have become somewhat steady state, but instead here I am like somewhat over 60 and life is actually really exciting with all this cool tech and just seeing all yeah. this stuff just continue to Yeah, I, to I actually, I, I believe we are kind of entering in a new period of server design where um, custom silicon uh, acceleration is going to define what the industry looks like for the next 10 years. I think it's one of the most exciting points in my career. I think customers are starting to pick up on this quite a bit. And I, I, I remember back in the early days of EC2, and I would eagerly describe it to an audience, and they'd listen, and some of them would kind of get it and say, this is, this is different. And some of them would just say, you know, there's nothing special here. This is just a bunch of servers. It's just a, it's just a bunch of generic servers. Anybody could do this, and you, you guys have nothing special to contribute. And you know, even back then, we would certainly design and spec and build servers to our own requirements. But now I think we're at the point where we're really doing things that customers couldn't do for any number of different reasons, right? We, we've got the diversity of use cases. We've got the scale. We've got this just so many different talents that need to contribute to doing something like this. And it, it's just, I think, pretty amazing, unique thing that we can do here at AWS. A absolutely, and I think the Nitro system is a great example of this because um, if you look at what most folks were doing for virtualization, they were taking servers that were not designed for virtualization. They were designed to run Windows or you know, a lot of them even to be able to run DOS still. And so they have all these legacy components, all of you know, these, these old kind of technologies. What we've done with Nitro is we've designed a server from first principles, um, specifically for virtualization, for hosting multi-tenants in a secure and safe way. Um, no company is going to do that and, and try to sell it for data centers um, at scale. You know, no customer is going to be able to build a server on their own because it's a massive investment. Um, but our scale makes it possible, and I, I think the results are, speak for themselves. I it's, think so. It, it's it's certainly the scale, but also the fact that. A lot of customers, they'll build a data center, they'll, they would, well, in the past, they'd build that data center, they'd populate it with a generation's worth of hardware, and then they just say, let's keep this for as long as we can and just eke out as much of a return from, yeah. from what we have. Yeah. But here we, we're always expanding and we're always adding more AZs, more regions, more instance types. So we have this kind of like hungry shark that just keeps wanting more more totally. in, in the way of, of new new compute power and new instance types so we we do have this opportunity to keep putting new generations of tech in there yeah totally and i think there's two like uh, great features of nitro to call out um that really sh sh highlight the idea that you couldn't build this in your data center even if you wanted to um, so one of them is that within the nitro system so these cards um, 
there's no SSH. There's no ability for a human to log into the system. Um, it is purely hermetic. You, you, you can only access it through defined APIs. Um, and this is really important because ultimately in EC2, the most important thing we do is protect customers' data. And having a system where you know, no human or even no control plane can access a customer's data is super powerful from a um, security point of view. If you're building this with uh, open source hypervisor or even VMware, mm -hmm. you're going to have a full-blown Linux system where you can log in. There, and there's there's just, a very big surface there. Yeah, there's no other way to do it. And to get to this level of manageability, you have to start from scratch. So everything on these cards we've built in-house. Um, you know, we're not running a Linux distribution or anything like that. It's, everything's built um, from the ground up. Wow. The, the next thing that's really kind of fundamentally different about the Nitro system is that all of the software that runs on these cards and on the hypervisor is live updatable. And so when we have to push out a security fix or even a functional fix to the entire fleet, we're able to do that um, instantaneously without customer uh, downtime. And that doesn't require live migration or any other thing like that. We're actually able to do it entirely in place on the cards themselves. Mm -hmm. um, that means we're able to have an extremely high amount of operational um, uh, you know, um, uh, efficiency because every couple of weeks we just do a deployment and we completely replace the software uh, within the, um, the entire hyper You do that fleet. just to keep it fresh? We do it to keep it fresh, to roll out new um, updates, and to ensure that um, we're able to iterate very quickly. So I'm kind of embarrassed to admit, but I have an EC2 instance that's been up for like 780 <laughs> days. But that, even though the instance has yeah. been running, it's, okay. it's still running fresh software that's okay. in I, the Nitro system. I, I actually, that's on the hypervisor, yes. You should update your instance. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do actually keep all the, all the, the patches <laughs> up to date, but uh, yeah. the, the kernel's that For what that it's old. worth, I actually made sure that I launched an in, a Nitro instance before we launched Nitro so that I could have the oldest Nitro instance in the fleet. <laughs> oh. And so I do, I do have the record for the oldest Nitro instance uh, okay. in the fleet today. Um, uh, I, I had an, an M1 small for, that got to well past a thousand, thousand days, and then Peter DeSantis said, he came to me one day, saying, he said, Jeff, I think you're the last instance in the rack, and it's time, time to retire this, this instance, and please let it go. So. It, it is actually one of the amazing things about EC2, though, is that even the M1 instance type you can still launch today. And there's another really cool thing that we've done with Nitro um, to make sure that we can keep on saying that. Uh, one of the recent things that James Hamilton um, announced on one of his on a blog post is that we've actually modified the Nitro system in the last year so that we can actually run Zen instances on Nitro using the Nitro hypervisor. So we're not running Zen on the cards or anything like that. We just added a personality that's compatible with Zen. And that's so that you can continue to run your M1 instance on brand new Nitro hardware as long as you want to run it. Okay, and so, so effectively there's... There's a layer, so so we've got our like we got our instance here that looks M1, but then there's something in between and says, okay, this this brand shiny, literally shiny new hardware looks like this really old hardware from 2006. Yep, absolutely, and that way customers can just migrate their workloads without even having to worry about you know changing their AMIs or modifying their applications, and it just keeps working. That that's an extraordinary amount of energy to put into keeping our, our customers happy. That's, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I think that's just one of the things that's fundamental about how we do things uh, at Amazon is that you know, we're always going to uh, um, develop our roadmap based on customer feedback. And if customers want to continue, for a lot of customers, it's not that they want to run on Zen. It's that they just don't want to make any changes. They, they have something working, and they don't really see a reason to make any changes to it. We want to support those customers. Yeah, that, that's good to hear because far too often in our industry, it's kind of too bad, so sad. We're going to move on to the next thing. And those of you in the past, well, you know, up, upgrade or else. And Absolutely. And that's another cool thing is that um, as we progress through the lines of 10 gigabit to 25 gigabit to 100 gigabit networking, as a customer, you didn't have to do anything to get those advantages. Um, because of the virtualization that we provide, you don't need to install new drivers. You don't have to need, even need to upgrade your operating system. You're able to take the same AMI that you use to run on this generation of card, run it on this generation of card, and you just get the benefits from it. You don't have to make any changes on your side. That is really nice. And that, that is something I do talk to people quite a lot about is the fact that what's underneath what you run, it's getting better all the time without any effort whatsoever or awareness on your part. And it's, uh, we're, none of what we do in AWS is effectively static. We're, mm -hmm. we're, and then, in fact, we do a lot internally that we don't get to share with our customers about how much 
continued profiling and optimization that we do after we launch something to just keep making it better and better and better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if you're if you've lived in the uh, industry pre-cloud, you know, Most you'd of spend, my career, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> same for me as it turns out. Uh, you know, you, you were used to having planned maintenance windows in the data center where you'd have to come in and like manage uh, manual failovers. You know, constantly worrying about um, patching of the underlying system, new hardware upgrades would require like massive recertification efforts. Um, that's kind of the amazing thing about the cloud. And one of the things that's amazing about the Nitro system is that as a customer, you just keep getting all of this really deep hardware based innovation and you don't have to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you just you constantly only get benefit. the benefits from it. You, you don't even know it's there, but you get right. that great and amazing it's, benefit. And from it's it. because underneath the covers, we're doing all of that work on behalf of customers. We're putting all the effort into making sure that generation to generation, their workloads just keep working. I, I really love it. Um, so you talked a little bit about the agile development module as it applies to hardware, which is very, very different from my limited understanding of how hardware is built. What, what's that all about? Um, so typically in the hardware cycle, you have a fixed amount of time where you can actually do design work and development work because at some point in time, you have to produce a chip. You have to make a commitment. I mean, <laughs> you have to make a commitment and you have to produce the chip. And then once you produce the chip, uh, you have to try to make it work. And so you do lots of testing, you try to find issues, you try to find problems, but ultimately you really want that chip to work. And so you try <laughs> to figure that out. The thing that has been really powerful for us uh, in building the various generations of Nitro cards is that um, we know the software we're going to run. And so we're actually able to run that software in an emulation environment. And we're able to prove out a lot of the underlying silicon long before we have um, physical silicon. Okay. That's one of the reasons that allows us to go much, much faster than you normally would in this type of industry. Um, but yeah, like finding ways to make sure the hardware and software teams are working really close together is super critical. Um, you know, I've, I've worked at other companies where the software team was not allowed to talk to the hardware team. Like tra mm -hmm. traditionally in a hardware company, the software team's a second class citizen. They, uh, they just get mm -hmm. specs and they have to figure out how to build the software to the hardware. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the fundamental differences with how we've built the Nitro system is that I really feel like we all work together as one team and the, hard, the hardware engineers are just as involved in the software decisions and vice versa. And it really gives you a unique type of innovation. Now, does the, the software in effectively the, the guest OS that the customer is running, does it have any awareness of Nitro? Or does, is Nitro totally, totally <coughs> remote controlling from the outside yeah. what's going on? The, the only awareness that the um, the guest OS has of Nitro is the type of I.O. devices it sees. And so um, if you plug one of these cards into just a standard um, machine, it would look like two different types of devices. It would look like a ENA network card, which is a network device that we've created. And so we build a driver for that for all modern operating systems. And then an NVMe storage device because NVMe has become a very um, pervasive standard in the industry. And so as long as your guest has an ENA driver and an NVMe driver, that's it. It doesn't need to have any special knowledge of the Nitro okay, system. Okay, so, so there's no real, there's not a such thing as a Nitro driver in the guest OS? The, no, like not that. at all. We were able to support any kind of standard operating system. That, that's super, super cool. So Nitro on here, but it looks just like standard, standard interfaces to the, the rest of the system. Absolutely. Amazing. Yes. Well, we're just about out of time. Any other? I think we could talk for like five more hours. But I, I know, and it's, it's always great talking with you, Jeff. Any other cool things that we should yeah. talk about here? I, I think that the, um, the, the security posture of the Nitro system by having a, all of the EC2 logic in a separate physical computer, I mean, it is just, it is so powerful for so many customers. Um, it makes entire classes of security vulnerabilities like hypervisors escapes just not a thing. Yeah, there's just no data path. There's just no data path because it's a separate system. And uh, you know that kind of model, I'm convinced, is the future of virtualization. I think that Nitro-like architectures are just the way that all virtualization is going to work moving forward. Um, uh, and I think you know we've got a pretty big head start on that, which is super exciting to be a part of. Awesome. Well, wish you best of success, and maybe Thank we'll you. be here back in like two more years, and we'll need a wider I, table. I so. sure hope so. That would be wonderful. Awesome. Been great, great to, to speak with you. Yeah, it's been great, Jeff. Thanks awesome. for having me. Best of luck with continued Nitro. Thank you very much. This has been Jeff Barr, been speaking with Anthony, and I think we've learned quite a bit. I've learned quite a bit about Nitro System today. Uh, thanks for watching, and stay tuned for the rest of the day. We have a ton of really awesome content still queued up for your, for your viewing pleasure.